the first thing you want to ask your partner or your family is, well, how would we like to have a meal? You want wretched, nasty food that someone just threw together, and it's burnt, and we're going to fight about it all the time, and it's really erratic, and it's not predictable, and, and the person who's making it is unhappy, and the kitchen is a disaster afterwards, and everybody's angry about that. So that's like one solution. Do you want that? And if they all are sensible enough to say no, then, then you can say to them, okay, well, what's the alternative? And then you can think, well, we could imagine what the alternative would be, and then we can work on laying out the microprocesses that would lead to that outcome. And we can practice them over time, and we can assume that if we don't get it right in three months, that doesn't mean it's hopeless. And so, when Freud... Let me give you an example. I was reading a Gottman study the other day on marital stability. Gottman has done some really good analysis of couples' behavior. He has set up a lab that's basically a bed and breakfast, and he brings couples in there for a weekend, and he wires them up physiologically and monitors their reactivity. And so what he's, he can predict whether a couple's going to divorce with 95, 94% accuracy. It's like impressive. So what has he found? He's found two categories of, he's, he's identified two phenomena that are very much worth knowing. The first is that the, the couples who are going to get divorced, they come into the bed and breakfast, and they speak with each other quite calmly. But it's more walking on eggs calm. And while they're speaking with each other calmly, their physiology is like, they're very aroused, and so, so they're sort of aroused like someone who's facing a predator. So you might think of an unhappy couple as predator and prey to each other. And so the words are there mostly to stop predatory activity, not to actually communicate anything. It's just to keep the surface calm. So then you might think, well, what's under the surface? And what's under the surface, so Freud would say, it's what's under the surface is unconscious. And, but you can say, well, what's under the surface is one of these hierarchies that's all banged up and twisted and, and, and not in reasonable shape. And so people don't want to open the door to that. So, but they do. This is a Freudian slip. So let's say this is, goes to the second part of Gottman's observations. So the, the woman goes over to the window and she says, oh, look, there's a cardinal outside. You know, cardinal is that bright red bird, they're kind of cool looking. You know, it's kind of a trivial thing in some sense, but by the same token, it's like, it's a little positive thing, and you know, 20 of them in a day is a good thing. Okay, so then the, uh, the partner, the husband in this example, has a two-by-two two matrix of choices. One is, who the hell cares about your stupid bird? Okay, so that's one. The second one is, <sighs> Then you go over and look at the bird, right? And the, the third one is, you don't make the contempt noise, but you act it out. And the fourth one is, um, you go over there like a civilized human being, and, you know, and that you're interacting with someone that you care for, and you take a look at the damn bird, and you're happy about it. And, it, and that's as truthful and real as you can manage. Okay, so, the <sighs> option, that's a Freudian slip. Right? Because what it says, there's a whole monster underneath that, and the monster is all the disorganization in this entire structure. It's like the, might be, we have been tormenting each other about various things for the last ten years, and none of them are resolved, and I'm not very happy about you for so many reasons I can't even remember all of them. And I'm, I can't enumerate them right now because that would take forever and maybe we would have a huge fight. But by the same token, I'm not going to come over there and make you happy with your stupid bird. So what the good couples do, the couples that, you know, stay together is they respond to each other's bids. He calls them bids. And so if one person wants to share some little trivial daily positive thing with the other, the other, you know, isn't carrying around a bloody cartload of resentment and is able to respond to that in a positive way. And that way, the general interactions between the couples stay positive. But that's also because they've worked this out. 
Now, you know it's got to be because they work it out, because the couples who are physiologically reactive to each other, they're communicating, but there's all sorts of horror underneath the surface. And we're trying to figure out, well, what is it that's underneath the surface? What's the structure of the unconscious? Well, that's the structure of the unconscious. And it's either well-structured and functional, and mutually agreed upon and as explicit as possible, or it's this, constantly. And then when the couples fight about it, because they're not very sophisticated, and they're not very awake, and they're not very aware, and they don't know how to do microanalysis, and they're tired and unhappy, they don't say, I would rather that you use cloth napkins when we have a formal dinner, then paper napkins. They say, you do a bad job of entertaining. Well, that's not helpful, right? It's like you're wiping out the person that bad job of entertaining would be probably about at the level of family care in the hierarchy. And so what you're doing is you're hitting them in a place that if they listen to you would knock out maybe 10% of their entire be behavioral and perceptual structure. It's like, you really want to do that to someone? You only want to do that to someone under extreme conditions, right? Extreme conditions. And that would be something like maybe a warning to a child who's gone astray very badly, but you know has the skills. You'd say, well, the kind of mistakes that you're making are sufficiently catastrophic so that your life is going to go off course. You know, and then you might have a conversation with them about Often for kids, for, guy, for people that say are between 15 and 25, I know they're not kids really, but my kids are that age. Part of that might be, what the hell are you going to do for a career? Right? And if that's unspecified, the person's just all over the place. So, okay. So, so here's some slides that represent that. Right? So you see the progression of that, and if, you're, if things are operating at the top of the hierarchy, that, what that means is you've mastered all the subsidiary elements, and you've built them, it's not only from the bottom up, but because the, the levels cross talk, right? You know, so you can use, and that's the next thing we're going to talk about, because you're not just a behavioral creature, you're not just an animal like a chimp, you're capable, there's, there's things you can do that animals can't do, and what that is, is that not only can you act things out in a manner that through action will organize your hierarchy, because that's what animals do, but you can also represent that hierarchy. You can think about the hierarchy, you can articulate the hierarchy, and you can play with it abstractly. And that's what you're doing when you're engaging in philosophy, and that's also what you're doing when you're negotiating. And that's a really good thing, because it means that you can not only conceptualize changes and then implement them, and, and you can conceptualize a broad range of poten potential changes and improvements, and you can implement them and you can observe what happens, but you can also communicate that to all sorts of other people. So it's a great thing to be able to do. The problem with it is, obviously, that because you can abstractly represent and question, you can also knock the hell out of your belief in the top elements of the hierarchy. It's like, well, what does it mean to be a good person anyways? You know, or why should I be a good person? Or is there, any, is there any utility or meaning in being a good person? Or is there even any, is it even reasonable to say that there's such a thing as a good person? It's like, I think all of those questions in some sense are ill-posed. And the reason I think that is because they're at the wrong level of resolution. You know, you don't throw the damn baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So if you're going to critique something, don't start, don't start at the highest level of abstraction. And I think that's a big part of what's wrong with what people are taught in universities today, because you're often taught to criticize systems at the highest level of abstraction. It's like, well, there's something wrong with capitalism. It's like, really? Really? You're going to do something about that, are you? And it's going to work better in your lifetime. That's going to happen. It's like, no, it's not going to happen. You know, if you stick a stick in, in a functioning machine, even if you think the machine it's all rattly and it's like pulling people's arms in and it's got all sorts of catastrophic problems, you come along and, and like hit it with a stick, it's like it's not going to run better. 
It's the wrong level of analysis. And just because you have a stick and you can see that the machine doesn't work very well doesn't mean that you're very bright. It's like, obviously it doesn't work very well. You know, it's like, that's not the issue. The issue is, could you improve it without making it worse? 